Okay, everyone, let's welcome Chloe Murphy on our presentation here today. Despite lack of formal conservatory training, like his fellow composers, uh, he was a successful po a composer of his generation and composed in most genres of music. Uh, these are some large-scale compositions he was known, known in for. Uh, you may recognize pomp and circumstance marches. Uh, that's at our graduation ceremonies, uh, land of hope and glory, coronation ode, and sea pictures, which we're going to be diving into today. Some musical influences were his faith, spiritualism, Catholicism, and mysticism. Uh, other composers, Germanic composers like Mahler, Strauss, and Wagner. And his musical uh, musical training was a little bit different. He was a freelance musician. Uh, he took professional violin lessons and later, later held the organist position at his Catholic church. Uh, marriage and family meant a lot to him. His uh, marriage with Alice Elgar was an artistic partnership. She was a poet. Uh, they got to collaborate in a lot of his uh, pieces, uh, even one in Sea Pictures. And his music always told a story, uh, whether that was through the poet poetry that he was using or with the music that he was composing. composing. And he had a patriotism for England, a love for the royal family, which you can see through his coronation ode, Land of Hope and Glory, uh, pieces like that. So C Pictures was composed between 1897 through 99. Uh, it's five songs and features five different poets. And uh, one of those poets is including Alice Elgar, his wife. And the structure of work is similar to a typical romantic era symphony, but he added one song. So it starts off with a large allegro piece, then it's followed by a small Adante piece. Then the extra movement is large, followed by a scherzo small piece, which is a playful piece. and then ended with a long epic piece. Uh, the music depicts and illustrates the mood of the moods of the sea. So England is surrounded by water. A lot of the locals can connect to that. Uh, these waves could be dangerous, stormy, uh, they could be playful. And so he really did a great job of tying those into all of the pieces. Uh, there's two versions of this work, one for piano and voice, and then orchestra and voice. And they debuted two days within two days of each other in fall of 1899, uh, Elgar conducting and at piano with British contralto Clara, Clara Butt. So these were some of the poets that he used. Um, all of these poets had a sense of spiritualism and a personal con which had a personal connection for Elgar. And most of the poets were contemporaries of his time in the 19th. Slumber Song by Rodin Noel. Uh, the poem is set in its entirety uh, with several repeating lines of text. So the listener can kind of picture a mother lulling a baby to sleep. Good night is repeated many times through it. Uh, so you get good night, good night, good night. Um, it's a really peaceful song. The, there's alliteration set in lyrical vocal lines, such as slumber songs, whispering waves, moves and winds, wails and woes, and slumbering, or shelly sand. Uh, opening phrase, the opening phrase of Parallel 6 sounds like a gentle wave rolling to shore and then risking. And uh, it does not appear to be set in uh, major or minor in tonality, but the ambiguity of keys set the mood for a tranquil depiction of the sea in an aura of mystery. So here's these Parallel 6 that I'm talking about. Three verses in C major. 
It was originally published as Love Alone Will Stay and was later edited for Elgar's setting. Uh, the running thirds of the piano is evocative of playfulness, the gentle warm gulf of Naples off the Isle of Capri. Um, this, is a, this was a really special place for uh, Alice. She spent a lot of her childhood there with her family. And although the two never traveled, Elgar and his wife, that's a couple to Italy, uh, it just kind of reflects their personal and professional relationship they had with each other to be able to collaborate for this piece. So these are the running thirds that kind of depict the gentle waves.
Judy Gordon is the fifth and final song. The original poem has 104 lines, 13 stanzas with eight lines each. Um, this poem uh, reflects a turbulency in which the swimmer finds himself lost in love uh, with a lost lover, and he imagines being drowned by these um, thrusting waves. He uses personification to liken the voice of the sea to a human voice. Uh, he uses phrases like babble and prattle and ripple and murmur. Uh, text painting is found in the words, oh brave white horses, you galloping, you gather and gallop. The storm sprite loosens the gusty rain, and as this is being said, uh, there's a broken arpeggiated, there's broken arpeggiated triplets which evoke a gall galloping horse. The moment of silence at the end of the song is akin to uh, the amen at the end of a prayer. And it, it really comes out as a dramatic scene at the beginning. Or, or others didn't know? 
Yeah, I um, didn't realize that he was a self-taught composer because usually you think of these composers going to these elaborate schools and um, you know he really got to learn just by the, the people around him, uh, the instrumentalists around him. So that's something that's really interesting that I thought. Um, and also being able to work with his wife on his, his pieces, that's like a really beautiful story. So um, yeah, I would just have to say how he was brought up and how it was different than a lot of the other composers of his time. This give you an insight on like other British composers like mm -hmm. later on. Like, you, did you find like, uh, like say you listen to Benjamin Britten, you're like, okay, I really enjoy Edward Elgar's music and how that influenced Britain's. And I wonder if that led you to any other really cool like discoveries. Okay, so um, can you repeat that? One yeah, time? I guess I'm just saying like you know you're a musician, you see. Mm -hmm. um, did you discover any other really cool British compositions after hearing the Elgar? Like, did you dive into some Britain and like? and understand it was kind of similar and how it influenced it. Yeah, so actually I'm gonna angle this towards like a lot of his music and how um, even in the last song, uh, when it, it was a really dramatic song, uh, through some of it, you could kind of get the sense of like a march in it. So like he was using like Coronation Ode and Land of Hope and Glory, which were marches, but he was able to like transfer that, you know, type of um, feeling throughout even like really dramatic, songs about the sea so um, I, I do know so a fun fact about um, how the oh my gosh fun fact about how um, pomp and circumstance was welcomed into uh, the United States was they were trying to get Elgar over for a really long time and he just <laughs> didn't, he didn't really care about it like he was just more focused on um, England but there was a professor at Yale University um, who wrote him a letter, they were really close friends, and convinced him to come over. Um, and so that was where it was first performed, Pomp and Circumstances, over at Yale University, so, yeah. Yeah, question. So, um, in your research, um, you know, you obviously have to go through a lot of different sources to find your material, mm -hmm. et cetera. Was there one particular source that stood out to you that you uh, found to be a particularly foundational for what you were looking at? Yeah, so I actually found uh, classical or classic FM, so radio stations mm -hmm. that um, are giving information about composers before the songs go on, really helpful. Um, yeah, that's just uh, where I found a lot of it from. We've got a minute if you want to take one more question. Okay. Yeah. How would you say your perception of um, the piece changed after you sung it and after you did this research on it? Yeah. Um, so when you first learn a song, it's you're really focusing on making sure you can sing it and making sure it sounds good or making sure that you play well. But when you get this kind of sense of what it means and what was happening during this time period, um, you are able to express more emotion with it. So uh, after I learned a lot of this stuff, if I were to sing these pieces again, because I performed them before I had started the research, but I knew a little bit about um, what the song was I'm trying to describe, but uh, just a sense of um, how you show your face when you perform it, um, how your, your energy and, and different things like that. So like where land where corals lie, it's, it's a song about a childhood. So you wanna be really bright and energetic. And, but when, you know, um, the swimmer, it, it's more of kind of a mysterious song and um, kind of like a depicting like dangerous waves. So you wanna have kind of more of an intense look on your face. So. I would say a lot of with like emotions throughout the song changed. Yeah. Yeah, awesome job, Blue. All right, thank Thanks you.